Welcome to the Watcher Devices Automated Electric Physiology Webinar Series. This is the, the 12th webinar that we have in this series. If you'd like to view other webinars, um, please go to our website to the Automated Electric Physiology page, and um, all of the webinars are available there for viewing. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started today. Um, our speakers will be um, Glenn Kirsch from Chantest, myself from Electric Devices, and Jeffrey Weber from Electric Devices. Um, Glenn uh, is the Senior Director of Pharmacology and Program Management at Chantex Corporation, and he'll be speaking today about the development of high throughput assays for calcium channel pain targets on Ironworks Barracuda. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions, please use the Q&A tab at the top of the WebEx application. Um, we'll try to answer some questions live today. Um, if not, we, if we don't get to those questions, we will answer all of your questions by email um, after the webinar. So, um, with that, Glenn, are you about ready to get started? Right, yeah. <coughs> okay, um, I'll go ahead and pass the ball to you and you can go ahead and, and get started. Okay. I can see your slides, okay. Are we ready? Yep, we're ready to go. Very good. Well, thanks, Jim, for the uh, opportunity to present some of our uh, recent work. Uh, <coughs> Chantest, as uh, most people probably already know, is a contract research uh, organization, and we have a focus on ion channels uh, to provide uh, drug discovery and drug safety services for a, a variety of, of customers. Today I'm going to talk specifically about uh, some of the work we've been doing to uh, uh, develop and, and validate uh, calcium, voltage-gated calcium channel assays on the Ironworks Barracuda. Um, the notion that these calcium channels uh, are particularly relevant as pain targets really comes from uh, this kind of, uh, uh, of understanding of uh, how pain works, that is that uh, dorsal pain signals via the dorsal root ganglia enter the, the spinal column, spinal thalamic tract, the dorsal horn, and there's this relay here uh, where the primary neuron uh, connects with the secondary neuron via synapse, and within the presynaptic terminal of the DRG uh, cells are calcium channels, and the influx of calcium particularly through CAV 2.2 and CAV 3.2, uh, triggers release of uh, neurotransmitter. So inhibitors that act on these channels can uh, essentially uh, blunt this, uh, this relay system and uh, blunt the, uh, the pain signals that uh, are entering the, uh, entering the brain. And uh, for CAV 2.2 subtype, uh, it's the N-type calcium channel. It's a validated pain target. And compounds such as econotide and pregabalin uh, are uh, marketed drugs that uh, act as uh, analgesics on, on this target. And more recently, CAP 3.2 has been suggested as another pain target, and a compound uh, Z944 has been developed uh, based on uh, animal models that, that uh, indicate it would be a, a good uh, treatment for uh, inflammatory or chronic pain. So. With these pain targets, then, we want to be able to uh, uh, do subtype selectivity against other calcium channel types. And so what Chantest has done is to take the Ironworks Barracuda system and uh, use it as a uh, device to uh, essentially enter this uh, segment of the uh, ion channel target progression sequence of drug discovery. That is, the sequence that follows from a primary uh, single point high throughput screen, say in Flipper, and does uh, hit to lead and uh, lead optimization uh, using using an electrophysiology uh, uh, assay to uh, confirm with concentration response uh, curve uh, screening of the actives from the Flipper, flipper uh, screen, and then do subtype selectivity amongst the voltage gated uh, calcium channel subtypes counter screens against other targets and mechanisms of action uh, on the calcium channels, and then follow this up with uh, safety assays on, on other uh, electrophysiology platforms. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm going to focus on is the validation 
of uh, assays on, on Barracuda that uh, allow us to do this kind of uh, concentration response, pharmacology, uh, subtype selectivity, and some mechanisms of action. Uh, the Ironworks Barracuda system has a number of uh, big advantages in doing this type of work. It can operate in the population patch plant mode where up to 64 recordings from each of the 384 wells of the patch blade uh, can uh, generate a, a, a signal that uh, is an average signal from, uh, from the population cells. It allows uh, for 384 uh, channel pipetting and integrated uh, 384 channel electronic head to allow continuous voltage clamp uh, current measurement and uh, rapid solution addition that can be used for both voltage and ligand gated channels. And the individual well looks something like this. So the idea that you have continuous voltage clamp is denoted by a continuous uh, uh, connection with, a, with electrodes, and then the pipette uh, moves in and out of the well to uh, deliver compounds and uh, remove uh, solution. So in our hands, then, uh, with, a, with an optimized assay, we can run up to 10 plates per day. So you can uh, screen uh, 100,000 uh, compound library in about seven weeks or do more uh, 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 advanced uh, type of, uh, of experiments uh, as well in a, in a fairly uh, uh, high throughput mode. So to uh, present some of the uh, calcium channel data that we've obtained uh, and the progression of our uh, attempts to uh, develop a, a universal protocol for looking at the calcium channel subtypes, we first had to uh, develop cell lines, and we developed cell lines for the CAV 1.2, CAV 2.2, CAV 2.1, and the CAV 3.2 uh, channels, uh, mostly in show cells, but also in hex, hex cells for the CAV 3.2. And the first step then would be to uh, characterize the uh, gating properties of these different subtypes in the barracuda. And what you're looking at here are families of currents that are uh, elicited by test pulses uh, in 10 milli millivolt increments from minus 80 to plus 60, and then plotting the, uh, the currents uh, for the different subtypes along uh, the voltage axis. And what you see is a clear differentiation between the um, high <coughs> between the high voltage activated channels, such as the CAV 1.2 and 2.2 and 2.1, versus the low voltage activated channels, the T-type CAV 3.2, which lies at the low voltage end of the of the activation of the high V curve, versus the high voltage channels uh, at all uh, peaking at potential is more positive than, uh, than zero. We also looked at uh, the inactivation curves. As you would expect, uh, there is a, uh, a low voltage uh, inactivation curve for CAV 3.2, which is occurring at very negative potentials, and for the uh, uh, high voltage activated channels, uh, the inactivation curve is uh, all in those positive, uh, uh, much more, it shifted much more positive potentials. So we have evidence from this type of um, study that uh, the biophysical characteristics are, are similar between uh, the Garakuda uh, uh, assay and what we know from the literature about these uh, types of channels. Next thing we wanted to do, of course, was to look at pharmacology. And uh, one of the important uh, pharmacological differences between uh, the subtypes uh, is a comparison of uh, the N-type CAV 2.2 channel versus the L-type CAV 1.2. Uh, L-type, of course, are characterized by high sensitivity to dihydropyridine compounds, and that's what's, what's shown in these, in these uh, uh, representative traces, where we're stimulating uh, the channels at plus 30 millivolts in the case of CAV 2.2 and plus 10 millivolts in the case of uh, CAV 1.2. And we're preceding the stimulus with a uh, partially depolarizing uh, uh, pre-pulse so that we bring the channels into a partially inactivated state because we know that these are state-dependent compounds. And what's shown here uh, are superimposed traces uh, from the baseline, that is, uh, 
uh, before compound addition and then after compound addition in the case of the vehicle. What you're viewing here is this decrease in peak, which is uh, uh, representative of the uh, type of rundown that you see in this kind of assay. And then if you apply to CAV 2.2 or CAV 1.2, uh, 100 micromolar verapamil, what you see is a pretty much complete abolition of the, uh, of the peak currents. Uh, by contrast, uh, nifedipine, which is dihydropyridine, uh, shows complete block of the CAV 1.2. Uh, but virtually no effect on CAV 2.2 if we compare uh, the rundowns between vehicle and uh, nifedipine. Um, in, uh, conversely, then, uh, for VK uh, 8644, uh, which is misspelled here, uh, we see a, a potentiating effect, which is uh, consistent with its known effects uh, on CAV 1.2. But for CAV 2.2, uh, you begin to see some uh, uh, some, some blockade and at higher concentrations, uh, you see an uh, uh, inhibition effect of this, of this compound. So we have a selectivity for dihydropyridines uh, between these subtypes. Um, we can also begin to uh, develop assays that look at uh, some of the state-dependent features of uh, calcium channel block. And we know that uh, in most cases there's a depolarization-dependent uh, block augmentation in, in many of the compounds that uh, block calcium channels. And there's also a use-dependent uh, uh, component where repetitive stimulation also augments the blockade of the channel. So we developed some, uh, some protocols to look at this using verapamil as a reference compound, and here we're looking at the CAV 1.2 L-type channel. And uh, in this first uh, example, then, we look at uh, repetitive stimulation at one-second intervals from the minus 80 millivolt holded potential, and we're pulsing to 10 millivolts uh, with a brief 250 millisecond pulse. And what you see, then, is that uh, in the presence of uh, 10 micromolar verapamil, uh, the initial pulse, the first test pulse one, shows uh, some, uh, shows some blockade compared to the vehicle, but not a whole lot which would be indicative of its uh, relative uh, low potency against uh, resting channels. But then when we uh, apply a second uh, pulse uh, and have, uh, have the, uh, the ability to look at uh, use dependence, you see there's a very much larger block uh, for the second pulse. And if we just plot the, the concentration dependence of these effects, uh, tonic inhibition, uh, gives a, a 35 micromolar uh, IC50, and then there's leftward shift to 9.1 micromolar IC50 uh, for this uh, use-dependent uh, effect of verapamil. And there's also, uh, we also can uh, look at voltage dependence for, by using a, a, a depolarizing free pulse, in this case to minus 40 millivolts for almost a minute, and then do a test pulse to look at uh, how much additional block we we get from, from this uh, um, uh, from this uh, protocol, and you see that uh, if we do this kind of uh, procedure, that we get an IC50 value of that's even uh, even lower than the use dependent uh, IC50 that we got. So what we're really interested in is developing a kind of a, a multi-mode uh, protocol that looks at at, at, at both use dependence and voltage dependence or state-dependent block in the same uh, procedure. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a second. But I also wanted to point out that uh, we can look at use dependence in, in other subtypes. And uh, CAV 2.2, one of the pain targets, uh, uh, can uh, display the use-dependent block, particularly for medecoridil, where what we're looking at here is a, uh, a train of test pulses that are generated at 10-second uh, uh, intervals uh, in the presence of uh, varying concentrations of modafinil, And you see that the uh, peak currents uh, decay uh, during this train of, of impulses, and that uh, the uh, time course of the decay becomes faster and faster as you go to higher concentrations. So, this is uh, indicative of the uh, use-dependent uh, phenomenon in CAV 2.2. And if we compare the IC50 values uh, for the first pulse versus the last pulse, uh, 
um, you get uh, this, this leftward shift from almost a, almost a tenfold shift. So we developed then a universal protocol to look at both of these phenomena, and this is again uh, the example from uh, CAP 2.2. So with Barracuda, we can uh, put together some pretty complex types of uh, voltage stimuli. And what you see here is the, uh, our attempt to look at both voltage and uh, use dependence in the, same, in the same procedure, in the same experiment. So in the baseline, then, uh, we're, giving, um, we're giving the first test pulse, which has a uh, depolarizing pre-pulse. And this uh, enables us to look at uh, some voltage-dependent uh, Block. And then we're following this up with a second test pulse, which, um, uh, which is preceded by a hyperpolarizing uh, pre-pulse. And what this does is to tell us, well, what sort of recovery from inactivation do we expect uh, by virtue of uh, giving this uh, depolarizing pre-pulse? Uh, some of the channels are in the inactivated state, and then we allow them to, part to, to recover as much as possible during two seconds. And you can see the result of that just in the vehicle um, that there's uh, uh, some recovery of the of the uh, of the current, but there's also some rundown going on. And then after we add the the test compound, we repeat the same procedure, uh, and then add to that a, a train of, of um, repetitive stimuli at in this case 10 hertz, uh, uh, 10 hertz, hertz uh, and giving us a train of 32 pulses to look at use dependence. And you see that uh, in the case of Mibephodil, um, there's, uh, there, there is some, uh, uh, there is a lot of tonic block, and there's uh, not too much recovery uh, in test pulse two. And then if we look at uh, use dependence, you can see that there is almost complete abolition of the current uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the train. And for Verapamil, we also see some very strong tonic block. Um, there's a little bit of recovery during the, the test pulse, too. And there's, um, uh, there's, there's some use dependence, but not nearly as much as we saw for uh, the back of the hill. And similarly, for CAS 3.2, we can use the same, uh, the same uh, multi-mode uh, protocol, but adjusting the, uh, the parameters to uh, account for the uh, differences in the, in the gating properties of this channel. And here we're once again looking at uh, Mibephodil, and we uh, look at the concentrations of uh, 3 micromolar and 10 micromolar uh, for test pulse 1, which is the, uh, the measurement of the uh, voltage dependent uh, uh, block. And uh, then we compare. We can compare that with uh, use-dependent blocks that we observe during uh, repetitive stimulation at these different um, concentrations. And if we plot that in a concentration response curve, once again we see this leftward shift for the use-dependent uh, uh, component of block. And from the Bethlehem, there's not very much difference between uh, the tonic and the uh, depolarized uh, state-dependent uh, component of, of block. So using this type of multi-mode uh, approach, we can do uh, profiling amongst the different uh, uh, subtypes. And uh, what you see here are uh, three examples of three reference compounds for alphamil, methadil, and thimazide. And uh, there's clear differences amongst the subtypes. Uh, for instance, uh, for instance, uh, methadil uh, shows a strong uh, use-dependent component uh, in CAP 3.2, uh, a much weaker uh, use-dependent uh, component in uh, CAP 1.2, but the use-dependence uh, remains uh, an important uh, feature for both CAP 2.1 and CAP 2.2. And for Apple shows a uh, somewhat different uh, profile. For CAP 3.2, the C-type uh, channel, uh, there's very little difference between uh, uh, state-dependent and use-dependent block. Um, there's much more uh, um, difference. Uh, there's much more um, state dependent block for uh, CAV 2.2, and uh, that's uh, also true for uh, CAV 1.2 uh, as as well. 
And for pinazide, it's clear that uh, CAP 3.2 is, 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 is sensitive, but there's in a state and uh, use dependent, in, uh, but just not in a state and use dependent way. Uh, CAP 1.2 is also sensitive to pinazide, but it shows a, a strong use dependence, and CAP 2.1 and CAP 2.2 are not very sensitive at all uh, to pinazide in this assay. So to quantify, these are the actual IC50 values that we get from just looking at uh, a state-dependent block and um, use-dependent block for the different subtypes. And just scanning down the different uh, uh, reference compounds that we've looked at, uh, for CAV 1.2, then um, we have a very potent block for the dihydropyridine and dicetapine. And we actually see this potentiating effect at very low concentrations of the CAD, uh, of the JK 8644. And, uh, 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 and Pimazide shows this effect that um, there's very little tonic block, but there's significant use dependent block. And similarly for CAD 3.2, Pimazide shows uh, some uh, uh, tonic level of block, but it also shows um, some use dependent. And then we saw the use dependence for Medefrodil in CAV 3.2. And um, we also see uh, indication of, a strong, of fairly strong use dependence for CAV 2.2 and CAV 2.1 for, uh, for Medefrodil as well. The other feature that uh, is shown in this, in this graph is that uh, the um, the robustness of the assay as, as uh, quantified by the, the Z prime score is, is quite good for all subtypes when we look at, compare between, uh, look at the signal window between verapamil and, and vehicle uh, for the high voltage activated channels. We see that the Z scores are all, all exceed 0 0.5. And for CAT 3.2, where we look, at, we use the reference of the Bepridil versus vehicle, we also get um, high Z scores, both for uh, the state-dependent uh, block and also for use-dependent block, and that is true for, for all the subtypes. So what we see is that uh, Ironworks Barracuda provides a very useful way of looking, um, of, of providing uh, additional information that can come out of a uh, uh, initial screen. So for instance, if we were to take uh, a, a uh, a library of, uh, say, 500,000 compounds, which would be uh, typical of a uh, ion channel targeted uh, library. Uh, and typically, we would get uh, maybe 1% actives out of that primary screen. We can take those actives into the Ironworks Barracuda and do an eight point uh, concentration response uh, confirmation and end up with about uh, using, uh, looking at about 5,000 compounds from the primary screen. And uh, if 10% of those compounds were confirmed, uh, we could move on in Barracuda to look at uh, subtype selectivity and uh, do counter screens against other targets, as well as uh, examine uh, in a fair amount of detail the, the mechanism of action by looking at state-dependent, use-dependent, tonic versus, uh, versus uh, voltage-dependent blocking. And if out of that we get about 10% uh, compounds that we want to look at more closely, we can move those on to uh, looking at some safety issues. And the cardiac uh, ion channel panel would be a, a, a prime target for uh, that type of uh, approach. And that could be done in a number of platforms, including manual patch or uh, patch express. So in conclusion, then, what we have is a, uh, a way of doing uh, fairly high throughput uh, uh, studies that uh, give um, very useful information on pain targets, in particular calcium channels. And uh, we can do this in a fairly high throughput mode. So I would like to uh, end just acknowledging that most of this, uh, or essentially all of this work was done by our Ironworks uh, leader, Yuri Turashev, and the uh, cell line development was done by our cell line uh, by our cell biology team, and including Kayan Wu, Jitian Yu, and uh, Pete Harrelis. And uh, the head of our discovery services is Emir Guzik. 
And you can certainly get more information about our, our assays uh, by going to um, our website. And if you have uh, specific questions or you need uh, pricing information or uh, any kind of other questions, uh, you can email us at info at chantest.com and it, uh, we'll uh, respond promptly to your, to your uh, inquiry. Thank you very much. Right. So thank you, Glenn, for that really nice talk. Um, there are actually a couple of questions that came through um, that maybe we'll just ask them now if that's okay with you rather than wait to the end of the, of the webinar. Is that okay? Glenn? Yeah. Um, can I go ahead and ask you the two questions now? Go ahead. Okay. Um, one of them is, have you found barriers to be useful for other pain targets? Um, for example, sodium 1.7 or NMDA receptors? Yeah, we've reported on a number of uh, other pain targets, um, uh, particularly sodium channels, and NAV 1.7 is one of the, uh, the most important pain targets, and we've developed assays very similar to the CAV assay uh, against uh, sodium channel subtypes from NAV 1.1 through NAV 1.8, and uh, we've got, uh, done this on Barracuda and uh, with good results. We've also looked at some ligand-gated channels. Uh, that are pain targets, uh, ASIC-1A, we've done on Barracuda, and um, we are currently uh, looking at, and we've, we've done other ligand-gated channels on Barracuda. We have those assays available for GABA, anotropic GABA receptors, and uh, we are currently working on both uh, nicotinic receptors, ionotropic nicotinic receptors, and uh, also looking at uh, NMDA receptors. That turns out to be um, a, a, a target that uh, is very readily uh, recorded in Barracuda, but uh, the, what we're struggling with right now is developing cell lines that have low uh, levels of baseline activity because that can uh, reduce the signal window that you would uh, that you see in Barracuda. So that the NMDA receptors are work in progress. Um, ASIC is available, uh, we can do NAVs and we can do CAVs. So we have a fairly uh, a large repertoire of assays on Barracuda that can be uh, used in a uh, counter screen for, uh, for pain uh, programs. Okay, thank you, that's especially interesting. I hadn't heard of any of the receptors on Barracuda before, so that's good to hear that that's, that looks promising. Um, the second question is, um, have you tried using barium as a charge counter? The calcium channels? Yes. Uh, yeah, a lot of assays, a lot of companies run assays using barium as a charge carrier uh, in, in, in CAV channels. And we've, we've tried that in both Quattro and Barracuda uh, with the hope that uh, it would reduce the amount of rundown. But uh, it actually, in our hands, it, it really didn't help uh, to reduce rundown, which is always a problem in these types of assays. Uh, Parenthetically, Barracuda seems to be less uh, susceptible to that error, the rundown error, because uh, with, you know, 384 wells and continuous clamping, uh, you can uh, finish your experiments uh, more quickly, and that, uh, you know, avoids some of the uh, loss of signal due to, due to long-term recordings that can produce rundown. But barium hasn't helped for that, uh, for that in our hands, and also since now, the inactivation of these channels is both calcium and voltage dependent, so using barium uh, changes the inactivation properties. And then it, because, uh, you know, the state dependence de uh, of blockers can depend on inactivation, uh, then the pharmacology gets a little bit um, uh, messed up by using barium. So all of our assays are conducted uh, using uh, 7 millimolar calcium as a, as a charge carrier. Okay, very good. So thank you again for that really nice talk, and um, I think we'll go ahead and move on here to the, the next talk, which is actually by me. Um, thank you. So thanks, Glenn. Um, let me go ahead and get started here.
Okay, so this is also relevant to what Gwen was just talking about, what they used to pay. We've actually, um, a lot of our customers um, have been doing these use dependent or state dependent um, experiments, and we found some, some things about the experiments that they were doing that we, we went back and wanted to look at it a little bit in house our, ourselves. Um, so I think this talk is a good, or Glenn's talk is a good lead into what we're going to talk about here. So briefly, I wanted to show you what the tools that we have here at Molecular Devices um, for Ion Channel Drug Discovery. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm the product manager for automated electric physiology. Um, so I cover Barracuda, um, Patch Express, and the Ion Flux system, which is a new system that we're selling um, through molecular devices. Um, and Jeffrey Weber will be giving a talk on that next. Um, we also sell the, the Axon um, Instruments amplifiers, or their whole line of, of uh, amplifiers and digitizers. And so we really cover the whole screen funnel for drug discovery. Um, a little bit of background on the Ironworks Barracuda. We, we just launched the Ironworks Barracuda Plus system, and it, in, it includes some features that we have added um, in order to reduce uh, some rundown and some, some of these very long experiments that our customers were doing. But I'll just give you a very brief introduction after Glenn uh, already introduced it for the most part. Um, as he mentioned, that you can measure both most and ligand-gated channels, um, and that's because you, you can add and um, record at the same time, unlike previous uh, IMWorks instruments. Um, we, we have a throughput that we um, advertise as 1,100 data points per hour uh, uh, for screening, and then if you're doing compound profile and multiple compounds per well, I should say multiple concentrations of compounds per well, um, you can achieve higher throughput than that. I think Glenn gave probably a more realistic real-world throughput um, in his slide. So um, I think this is more of a theoretical, what can you do in one hour? Um, and that's basically because you can do a run in 20 minutes. As for the hardware itself, there are 384 individual amplifiers and uh, uh, 384 channel pipettes. So as Glenn mentioned, Everything's done in parallel, so they, the experiments can be done quite quickly. Um, also, uh, you know, if, with rundown issues and with any sort of electrophysiology, the faster you can get the experiment done, the better. Um, the uh, Barracuda also has, as previous Ironworks instruments have, uh, the population patch plant um, recording, which is recording from 64 cells at once. Um, what it does is average the current from those 64 wells, and what that does is it reduces um, biological, or I should say mitigates biological variability um, and gives you good uh, stable uh, recordings across the world. Uh, we also recently received a patent for the fluidic flow through design um, for our, um, our recording well, and um, that also helps us in with the wide assay windows that I'm going to present a little bit about today. Um, and lastly, uh, Ironworks has the lowest running cost of any automated ESIS platform, and that's because of the low cost consumable compared to our competitors. Um, so, what the Ironworks Barracuda Plus instrument is, is um, we've beefed up the, the original Ironworks Barracuda basically to allow for longer, um, uh, longer recordings and more stable recordings over time. So, the, the Ironworks Barracuda allows you to um, have multiple modes of operation, so you can operate in active development mode, which is very much like sitting in a rig where you can change the protocols on the fly um, and reapply them to the same cells um, for as long as the cells remain um, healthy and, and happy. Um, we also can deliver 600,000 data points per sweep. Um, obviously, the duration of that sweep is going to depend on the sampling rate. Um, unlimited number of sweeps can be acquired, so it, the digitizer um, we'll dump those sweeps after each recording so that you can record uh, unlimited numbers of sweeps. Um, Digitize your samples from uh, 100 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Um, and the, uh, another part of Barracuda Plus is that we've, we are able to achieve stable current recordings for very long periods of time, um, well over 30 minutes. We're up to about 50 minutes right now with some experiments. Um, and what this does is allow uh, for the measurement of not only use dependent uh, compounds or candidate compounds, but also the on and off rates for compounds that may have very slow on and off rates. Um, I mentioned the active development mode and the multiple modes of operation. So the way that that works is in active development mode, um, you, your 
original channel protocol can be modified any number of times. Um, and um, so, again, it's just like sitting in a patch plant rig where you modify the protocol and run it multiple times. Um, what multiple protocol mode is, is to take these, these uh, channel protocols that you've written and chain them together, and you can run them um, as a chain together protocol, so you don't have to sit there and, and load each protocol. It just automatically runs through the chain of protocols. And then lastly, screening mode is um, where you you put together, um, it's much like multiple protocol mode, but um, it runs from start to finish all the way through the cleanup protocol um, without any intervention at all. I mentioned some of these, uh, the, the um, chain together protocol, some protocols that someone might like to chain together would be some of these sophisticated uh, protocols like uh, most dependence of activation, most dependence of inactivation, and recovery from inactivation, as well as perhaps some pulse trains to look at use dependence. Uh, I just show them here individually, and again, these would be the types of, of or these are the types of uh, protocols that our customers are, are chaining together. Um, I'll show you uh, just briefly an, uh, a, a, some experiments that were done here in house on use dependence. And these aren't nearly as exciting as what Glenn showed, but um, these are on sodium channels. What we did was we had a 30 pulse protocol. Um, we delivered it at 10, 10 kilohertz, so we delivered it um, every 30 seconds. So you can see here the, um, pulse, the first pulse and the last pulse in the train, with um, their current sizes being very similar, or their, their current kinetics and sizes being very similar. Um, and the voltage protocol that we use is here. So basically, holding at minus 100 millivolts to step into minus 35 millivolts. Um, just briefly to show you the, the results here, um, we did see a, a use dependence with tetracaine. We tried tetracaine, lidocaine, and PTX. And we're just showing here the, the, uh, the compound plate layout where we had um, uh, PTX was in red, um, tetracaine was in purple and lidocaine was in green. And what you can see is that um, when we looked at just the first pulse, and we looked at the 50% block, only the, 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 tetra, the, uh, um, the tetracaine, I'm sorry, the, the lidocaine block became evident. So um, you can see here in green, the lidocaine block is circled in, uh, with red circles. However, when we looked at the, at the 30th pulse, um, out here at the end of the pulse train, um, you can see that the uh, the the the, um, the tetracaine became um, visible as as uh, blocking, and actually these are shown in green. But this this is actually sorry, it's a little bit confusing. It's the same compounds that that are shown in the compound plate. And basically, tetracaine came out of the um, you could see the tetracaine blocked only at the 30th pulse, but not at the first pulse. So it was, it was evident that tetracaine had a use dependence to it. Um, and you can see that visually um, here, uh, the actual, uh, I'm sorry, you can see the IC50s here for both the lidocaine, tetracaine, and TTX. And you can see that from uh, um, high concentration to low concentration, so high concentration on the left of the plate, you can see lidocaine blocking the sodium channels, this is sodium 1.5, and then at lower concentrations, left, left block, and then a, um, negative control and a positive control um, TTX here in, in column um, 12 and 24. Um, I'm sorry, TTX in column 12, negative control without TTX in column 24. And then just the dose response curves for lidocaine, tetracaine, and TTX. Um, and you can see them visually on the, on the, the, the um, heat map or plate map. Um, so this is the display that you get right after the experiment. We set this um, to the 50% block level, so you can see, um, similar to what you see in the raw traces above, the block by lidocaine, tetracaine, and TTX um, on the display that you get at the end of the experiment. Um, the results here are showing that um, at pulse 30 versus pulse 1, you can see that tetracaine um, blocked at about 5 micromolar in pulse 30, whereas it was at about 100 micromolar at pulse 1. Um, the other compounds showed a little bit of use dependence, but not, not nearly as, as much. Um, I'll show you the, uh, so this is, these are three different experiments um, done 
Um, and you can see the, the tetracaine numbers here at pulse 30 and tetracaine at pulse 1. Um, I'll show you a little bit more about the use dependent blocks with these other compounds, um, but uh, these are the, the dose response curves plotted, and I'll show you some uh, kinetics of the block in, in some subsequent slides here. Um, so, taking a step back, um, we were, you saw Glenn is doing, or Chantex is doing experiments on uh, for use dependent compounds. Many of our customers are doing that. And what we found was that um, they're, they're extending the assay window out sometimes just 30 minutes or an hour. And um, especially with sodium channels, we found that um, there was a little bit of rundown that was occurring during these, these experiments, where there was rundown occurring. So we went back to the lab. We tried to understand what was going on there. And we, um, we were able to, to, to um, add some features to the software, namely some fluidic features that reduce the rundown considerably. So we have two assay, uh, I'm sorry, two test protocols that we ran to extend the assay window. These are very demanding protocols. Um, this is running a protocol, um, a, I'm sorry, delivering a depolarizing pulse every 30 seconds for 30 minutes. And you can see here the, uh, the, the amplitude of the current. So um, it's a fairly flat um, with the current going up at first, or running up at first, and then running down at the end. Um, we're monitoring run up and run down within the individual experiments and between experiments. You can see here, we're also plotting during the course of the day um, the, for individual experiments what the what sort of rundown occurs. And um, as I mentioned, our customers were seeing um, more rundown than we're showing here in this in this figure. We wanted to get to the bottom of it, so. Um, we played around with that protocol and also with this protocol. What this protocol is, is we're delivering a 10 kilohertz pulse, um, 30 pulse frames, and we deliver that periodically for over the course of 30 minutes. Um, we're doing this in assay development mode. Um, and what we did here to, to show you just for ease of visualization is we plotted a negative peak current um, here as a bar graph, basically. So this is just a bar graph. It's not the raw currents themselves. Um, and what we also did was in, this, in these experiments, we added phosphorus to simulate compound addition um, at the arrows. And what you can see is nice stable, stable currents over time, over the essentially 30 minute time period. And I'll show you that in the next couple of uh, slides in more detail. Um, and this is actually, first I'll show you the, uh, the kinetics of use dependence for the experiments that I just presented for lidocaine, tetracaine, and TTX. And these are plotted in the same way that I just mentioned where the, um, the negative sodium currents are plotted as, as a bar graph. Um, and you can see on the control conditions, this is the figure I just showed you in, in a smaller uh, scale. Um, so these are control wells. Um, these, are, uh, this is, these are the wells containing tetracaine. You can see we added tetracaine here. And I should mention, um, we chose the uh, IC20 values of these compounds to display here. Um, at the first pulse. What that means is um, when, you, when this compound is first added in this figure, you'll notice that the, the initial block is at about, um, is about a 20% block of the current. That's true for tetracaine, lidocaine, and TTX. And we intentionally selected the traces. Um, these are dose response curves. So we, we intentionally selected the, the, the wells that gave about the 20% about the block in pulse one because we wanted to see what happened in subsequent pulses after the first 20% um, the uh, block at pulse one. So you, you can see there's a big difference here between tetracaine, lidocaine, and TTX. The tetracaine showed a very strong use dependence between pulse one and pulse 30 with almost a complete block at pulse 30. So a very large amount of use dependence here. Um, lidocaine less so. So it, it did have, it did uh, show some use dependence in the first few pulses, but then it, it fairly quickly reached the steady state. And TTX, much to our surprise, we expected no use dependence at all. Um, we believe that this is, um, is use dependence. It may just be a time dependence of blocks from the TTX. Um, we haven't looked at that further. But clearly there's differences in the kinetics of block of these three different um, uh, readily available compounds. Um, so again, we wanted to show the kinetics, and that's why we plotted these as bar graphs. We think it's easier to see this uh, plotted like this than the raw, the raw traces. 
Um, getting back a little bit to what we've done on the IWAC Barracuda uh, Plus system, um, enlightening the, the assay windows, um, we went back and we uh, to the software and changed some of the, the fluidics protocols from the original IWAC Barracuda, and we're quite pleased with the results of, in our ability to get a very long or very wide assay windows. Um, we were aiming for 30 minutes. We actually have achieved uh, longer times. And we'll actually be presenting that, um, our in-house application scientist, um, Shin uh, Zhang, will be presenting that next month. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of a teaser here um, as to the, the stability of these currents. So what, you, what you're seeing here, again, that the 31.5 channel plot is the bar graph. Um, and here we're showing all of the, all of the plots over the 30 minute time period. And if you look at the individual um, run up or run down, uh, along that, across that 30 minute time period, what I have, what I'm showing here is at pulse one, um, we're basically just dividing the, the amplitude of train, um, two by train one and down the line. So, um, you can see that there's not much variability with the exception of perhaps in this train, 10 over train nine, we have about 5% um, drop in, um, in, uh, the current. And I think that's I think most people would find that completely acceptable even on a patch flat rig. And the same thing with pulse 30, very stable currents. Um, again, for some reason between the train 10 and train or train 9 and train 10, there was about a 5% rundown. Um, so we were quite pleased with these results. Um, very stable, very wide assay windows. Um, and again, please look forward to a, a webinar we'll be delivering next month. And um, Shin, our application scientist, will be um, showing some work that he did with uh, um, peptides that block the sodium 1.5 channel and that have very slow on and off rates. And these are peptides that block and also activate the, the sodium 1.5 channel. We'll be presenting that next month. Um, with that, we're going to wait to take the questions until the end. So I think what we'll do is I'm running a little bit late. I'll go ahead and hand this over to Jeff Weber, who's a product scientist for, um, for iWorks. Uh, for, I'm sorry, iWorks. And he'll be presenting um, uh, an introduction to the IMSLUX um, instrument, which we're now selling through molecular devices. So, um, Jeff, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I can see your slide. Okay. Great. I can see it full screen. Okay. Excellent. So, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit of a uh, little bit about the IonFlux system today. Uh, the IonFlux is a uh, is a recent addition to the molecular devices product line. So to, uh, so today we're going to uh, go over a brief overview of the system, how the system operates. We're going to highlight temperature control as a key feature of the system, uh, and then we'll go through some example data. So the really the highlight of the system is uh, is a very unique fluidic system that gives you very fast fluid exchange, uh, and it's built around the the concept of uh, microfluidics and uh, and laminar flow. So this is a typical uh, GABA experiment, um, and we'll we'll look more uh, at this later on. So with the IonFlux system, uh, you get high data quality. Uh, you can get GigaCO recordings with a uh, single whole substrate plate, uh, as there's also ensemble recording for uh, improved success rate. Uh, it's a very it's a very cost effective system. Uh, System costs about the same as a uh, as a manual patch clamp setup. It's very easy to use. It's uh, it's a tabletop unit. It's it has about the same footprint as a plate reader, and it's a very reliable system. There's no robotics required. There's only two moving parts.
So how the system operates? Well, the real technology of the ion flux is actually built into the consumable plate. Um, and the consumable plate is built on a standard SBS format. Uh, there are two flavors of the ion flux. There's an ion flux 16 and an ion flux HT. The 16 is based on a 96-well plate. The HT is based on a 384-well uh, plate. Uh, and the bottom of the, uh, of the plate has been placed with, it has been replaced with a polymer microfluidic network, and this is really the core technology. Uh, it, and in, in that microfluidic network, you have integrated compound delivery as well as recording. So this is a, a blow up of what one of those, uh, what that microfluidic network actually actually looks like. So what we're looking at up here is the, the underside of an ion flux plate. And then we've taken one of what we call experimental patterns and blown that up here so that you can see it better. So here, trap one and trap two, this would be this would be analogous to your patch pipettes. The this in well this would be analogous to, to your bath solution. And then in in C1 through C8, you have all of your test compounds. This out well is simply the waste. So when you want to test a compound, uh, it's as simple as turning on a pneumatic valve, controlling, uh, sitting on one of these, these, these compound wells. You turn on the valve, compound flows and gets washed over your cells. Your cells are, are actually patched right here. Uh, and finally flows to the waste. So once you're done with your experiment, everything uh, is contained on the plate. All you have to do is throw the plate away. Uh, this is a cover of uh, assay and drug development technologies of August 2012. They featured the ion flux technology on their cover. Now, as I mentioned, there are two different uh, two different substrates that you can use. There's a there's an ensemble well, there's an ensemble plate and a single hole plate. Ensemble plates are designed for increased success rate uh, and uh, and and consistency. Uh, single hole plates are really designed for uh, for the highest data quality, so you can get uh, gigaseal recordings with single cell plates. So what we're looking at here, on the left, this is an ensemble plate. Now for every, uh, for every pattern that you have on, a, on a, an ion flux plate, there are two different traps. So, and, and what this means is that every recording you do on an ion flux plate, uh, you, you, are, you essentially get an N of two. So what we're looking at is the, this is what we call the main channel. This would be your, this this would be analogous to to the in well, uh, your bath solution, and you would have cells contained in this bath solution. Uh, your traps here would be your essentially your your patch pipette. So you would have your intracellular solution here, and uh, to attract a cell onto the hole, you deliver suction uh, from from this trap, uh, from these from these two traps. So you pull a cell onto the hole, you form a whole cell, and then when you deliver your test compounds, uh, these, uh, these, these tunnels right here on the right are your access to, the, uh, uh, to, your, to your compound wells. So your compound wells connect into this main channel and deliver the compound into the main channel. So as we said, uh, Ensemble uh, plates uh, um, will give you a higher success rate um, and uh, provide the, the, the highest level of, uh, of consistency uh, because of uh, inherent av averaging. With the ensemble plates, you have 20 holes per trap. So you have the ability of, of, of uh, controlling 20 cells at one time on a trap. Now these are all controlled, uh, so those 20 cells will be controlled by one electrode. So, uh, uh, so the, the current is actually added. 
and uh, ensemble plates are most appropriate for uh, screening type applica applications. So this is a, a plot of uh, a typical experiment uh, and, and highlighting the differences that you get between single cell plates and ensemble plates. And what we're looking at here on the, on the y-axis is seal resistance. And on the x-axis, we're looking at the, uh, the individual recording channel. So for an Einflux H, uh, and this is across uh, an Einflux HT. An, I, uh, an Einflux HT, um, oops, I'm sorry. An, uh, an Einflux HT uh, will give you 64 uh, independent recordings. So at the bottom we see uh, an ensemble plate, and you can see the uh, the seal resistance is uh, is, a, is consistent, uh, but but it's less than a gig ohm. But if we go to the top of the plate, our uh, our seal resistance gets a little bit more inconsistent. However, quite a few of these are actually over a uh, over a gig ohm. So this is a video showing how cells in an ion flux system are are trapped onto uh, uh, are, are attracted to the traps. And what we're looking at is we're looking at bath solution with uh, with cells flowing through. So up at the top here, you can you can see this is the trap. Here is the main channel where you have your extracellular solution with cells suspended in it. Inside this uh, this trap channel, you would have uh, uh, you would have your intracellular solution, and this is essentially your 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 your, your patch electrode. So one of the, the main features of the system is that uh, uh, you have continuous flow, uh, always moving from the moving from the uh, from the in well through the main channel, uh, finally to the waste. Um, continuous per, uh, continuous perfusion is uh, necessary for certain for certain applications. So in this continuous flow, the cells are are introduced and then trapped on the traps. Uh, you have 20 cells trapped in ensemble plates. You have one cell trapped per trap in single hole plates. Uh, the seals are formed and then finally we uh, obtain whole cell access using an extra suction pulse. So this video shows uh, the filling of the, of, of the compound walls and the flow of the main channel. The cells get pulled onto the trap. And then we deliver an extra, an extra suction pulse to obtain whole cell access. So compound uh, recording and compound delivery is is very fast, and you can do uh, successive uh, compound washes. Or this, the system is flexible enough that you can uh, use a, use whatever compound strategy, compound application application strategy you would like. Um, you have continuous compound washing, as we've mentioned before, since that main channel flow is always flowing. Uh, there are no pipettes for uh, for compound delivery, uh, allowing simultaneous application and recording across the plate. Uh, so uh, especially ligand-gated uh, channels, uh, the experiments are extremely fast. Because as I said, uh, delivery, delivering a, a, uh, a test compound is as simple as turning on a pneumatic valve. Um, the Einflux system does not have a liquid handling robot attached to it. Um, so, uh, which is a, a unique feature in, in automated uh, patch clamp systems. So, uh, so you're no longer tied to uh, serial uh, serial applications um, 
you can do much more advanced application strategies with uh, 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 with the INFLUX because of the, the, the laminar flow. Uh, 32 experiments uh, can be completed in a matter of minutes. Uh, the, the 32 experiments refers to the 32 patterns that you have available to you on the uh, on the Influx HT plate, and uh, using that math, you can you can uh, uh, test 500 compounds with 8-point dose responses in just a few hours. So this is a video showing uh, compound application, and as we mentioned, it's uh, you just turn on the pneumatic valve and the compound flows. It flows over the cells. And uh, it delivers it delivers compound using uh, principles of of laminar flow. So the cells are completely completely bathed in solution um, in in your your test compound solution. There is no mixing. There is no dilution. Uh, next, we'll go through uh, briefly. We'll go through uh, temperature control. Which is a key, uh, which is one of the the key distinguishing features of the ion flux system. So ion channels tend to have different activity at near physiological temperature than at room temperature. And the way that the ion flux system uh, applies its temperature control is with a, a, an electric heater that uh, uh, that that sits under the plate uh, because uh, with with the with the design of the ion flux plate, uh, the 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 pressure and uh, the, the access to pressure and and the electrodes actually come in from the top of the plate, leaving the bottom of the plate open uh, for heating. So what we call the interface comes down, and the interface contains the electrodes, uh, the the pneumatic pressure uh, inlets and outlets. Um, as well as a, a gasket material to make it to, uh, to make a pneumatically tight seal with the plate, and then finally a heating element comes up. This is a, this is an example of uh, what temperature control can do. This is a this is a herb channel uh, using erythromycin as uh, as our as our test compound. So. To the left, you see uh, erythromycin delivered at 22 degrees Celsius, and you can see that uh, we see very little effect of erythromycin up until we hit uh, one millimolar, which is a extremely high concentration. Next, if we heat this, uh, if we, if we heat the system up, uh, initially we see uh, immediately we, we see we see a uh, uh, an increase in current of about 40%. Then as we deliver erythromycin, erythromycin is much more active at physiological temperature. This is some uh, some pharmacology uh, that was done at uh, room temperature and physiological temperature. And you can see that uh, for some compounds, they're actually more potent. At, at physiological temperature, for certain compounds are actually less potent at physiological temperature. Uh, and finally, we'll, we'll go through some uh, some example data. Uh, so the Einflux software is very easy to use. You get extensive assay development capabilities. Uh, you have uh, runtime calculation. Uh, Runtime calculation and plotting of values in real time, so you can uh, you can monitor what your experiments are doing in real time, uh, and you can also pause and resume experiments. So so if there's something that you don't like, you can pause your experiment, make a change, and then continue with that experiment. This is how the data is visualized. Uh, the sweeps are are acquired and. Uh, and uh, the differences between uh, between cursors are plotted into a current trace chart. This is essentially uh, an IT plot. Uh, 64 sweep recordings are recorded simultaneously because we have 32 individual patterns, and each pattern has two traps. So that gives us 64 individual recordings. Uh, and the 
the trace date is plotted one zone at a time. A zone consists of one quarter of the plate, uh, or 16 channels. So you, you can view 16 channels overlaid at a time. So, example data. Uh, these, this is a uh, this is a, a brief list of some of the uh, some of the ion channels and some of the cell background cell types that we've tested on the system. Um, this is by no means a uh, a uh, an exclusive list. Uh, there there are more that 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 we have uh, that we have tested on the system that either uh, uh, haven't been updated yet or uh, we we can't disclose. Uh, one of the so this is a, a plot showing a, a recovery curve of nicotinic alpha one, and this is one of the uh, the interesting applications that you can do now with the the uh, the extremely fast uh, compound delivery that you get with the ion flux system. Um, traditional uh, traditional automated patch clamp systems uh, using pipettes. Uh, can be simply too slow in their turnaround time in order to uh, to do uh, recovery curves uh, for for ligand gated channels. Well, if you don't have a pipette based system, now all of a sudden you are not tied to that turnaround time for that pipette, or so you can do extremely fast additions uh, and do uh, uh, and 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 do these types of, of experiments. Uh, this is an example of NMDA using uh, glutamate, uh, and uh, we're in this experiment we're determining the EC50 for glutamate. Uh, NMDA is another key application of the uh, of the ion flux system because uh, NMDA is a very difficult channel to record, uh, but the ion flux system does it very successfully because of its continuous perfusion. As well as the the, the laminar flow of, of of the of the channels. Uh, so here we're uh, we're getting uh, if we look at our uh, if we look at our uh, uh, our graph here we we have a an EC50 of about uh, uh, 640 or 650 nanomolar. Uh, now, you can also do, um, you can of, of course also do uh, voltage gated channels on the ion flux system. And uh, this is a paper that was published uh, highlighting uh, HERG on the ion flux system. Uh, and we can see here the, these are some biophysics of, uh, of the HERG channel. We have our, uh, our, our activation of the uh, uh, activation of uh, of the activation step. We have our H infinity of the tail current, uh, and as well as some uh, uh, some example compound data here. Uh, next, we can look at some pharmacology. So, if we look at the IC50 values determined on the ion flux. As well uh, as well as the uh, IC50 values determined uh, or, or published in literature values, we can see that there is uh, that there is uh, there, there is close agreement uh, with almost all uh, being with being within the, the accepted twofold uh, uh, twofold agreement. And finally, uh, the last uh, slide here uh, just highlights the, the tools now that uh, molecular devices has uh, available for, for automated electrophysiology well, and, and electrophysiology in general. So of course we have the flipper, we have the barracuda, the ion flux, uh, the patch express, and as well as the axon, uh, the axon family of, uh, of amplifiers. So we, we cover the entire funnel from uh, from diverse compound library screening and HTS 
all the way down to manual patch clamp recordings. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jeff, for that, that presentation. Um, I hope the audience can see from Jeff's presentation um, why we are very pleased to have the Xbox as part of our portfolio here at Micro Devices. Um, it's really quite a unique instrument. It works very well. We urge you to, to have a look at it. Um, in terms of this webinar, we've run over time here a bit. Uh, we will answer all of your questions by email. Um, please submit your questions using the Q&A tab. Um, we will leave the webinar open for 10 minutes here to ask questions. And um, we will also be presenting uh, a webinar next month. And as I mentioned earlier, um, some of the uh, some peptide uh, activators and, and blockers for sodium channels. Um, so please look forward to that. We, we would like to see you next month at that webinar. Um, again, please submit your, your questions. We'll leave the line open for another 10 minutes. Thank you very much for attending today.